Hi, it's uh, my pleasure uh, today to introduce uh, Aunt Sue Chatterjee uh, of the School of Statistics. And Sue is a longtime member of the Population Center, and he does a whole bunch of topics that are highly relevant uh, to our uh, to our interests. Uh, uh, conditional statistical procedures, big data, uh, uh, resampling techniques, Bayesian statistics. Uh, and uh, uh, and today he's going to talk about the oh. geometry of high dimensional dependent data, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, uh, let us all welcome Ansu Chatterjee. Thank you. Oh. And I almost forgot too. As your pay, you get this coveted <laughs> seminar series mug that you can only get by presenting a paper here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to, uh, thanks to all of you. Uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, I had, I think in 2004 or five, I'd been, I bugged Steve and Kathy to make me an MPC member. And I've been a member for quite some time, although I'm not terribly active in, in terms of, you know, coming over here and attending seminar and actually enjoying the great food. <laughs> but I, uh, I uh, do keep track of the data sets. I actually use them in my class. I use the ACS data set now for three years running in, in the statistics PhD uh, class, the second year PhD class that we do on statistical methodology. And I use a lot of this uh, statistics data. But before I get started, uh, let, me, let me just, as it says, you know, make a shameless plug about another uh, university center. Uh, this is this is something that uh, it, we've started just about a year back. The Institute for Research on Statistics and its Applications, and I know I, I uh, we asked Steve for his opinion, and uh, you know we got some very positive feedback from a lot of people. This is a new center, uh, as a, about a year old. It is about uh, data science in all its form. Um, Statistics being a big component of it. We do computations, we do algorithms, we do, uh, I personally, my research is in the methodology part of it and proving theorems relating to uh, whatever we are doing statistically because uh, you know, unless you make, unless you're doing sensible stuff, uh, it's, uh, and that's something that you can uh, establish only by showing that it's mathematically meaningful. So. We do that, we develop software, all kinds of stuff, and actually the Statistical Consulting Center, uh, which some of you may have used, is now part of this. Uh, we've, we've streamlined a lot of the activities relating to that, and it's actually part of that. So, uh, one more plug. Tomorrow we have a, a workshop on data science foundations, challenges, and opportunities. The Vice President for Artificial Intelligence at LinkedIn is our speaker. Uh, well, we've got a bunch of other speakers from around the university and around campus, but uh, Deepak is, uh, so in case you want to join in, go over tomorrow, it's at the Computer Science Department, but it's an ERSA activity. So, uh, the topic today this is, this is about using geometry for statistical analysis. And so, as, as Steve mentioned, so what many of us do these days in statistics department is our biostatistics parts of a computer science department that, that deals with machine learning, artificial intelligence, is deal with what we know these days as big data. So this is data either big in terms of number of observations or big in terms of um, you know, the number of variables that you look at, the dimension of it, or both. So it's typically both. And much of the data that you folks handle here actually are big data. So, so this, this term is very, very, very loosely defined at this stage. And uh, <coughs> a lot of social science data is, is enormous in size, one way or the other. Uh, you do have a lot of complexities. So uh, part of what I'm going to present today started uh, 
when I wanted to take, so I have been working on climate change, climate related statistical analysis data science for the last 10 years or so. Uh, so that was all about, and that still is substantially about the physics of climate change. We want to see how, how aerosols from one place go and affect another place. But then at a point of time, you want to take it beyond physics and take it to its other dimensions. The most important other dimension, of course, is the human dimension. Uh, if you look at the IPCC, the international uh, group that, that decides on climate for the planet, you know, monitors that and writes reports about that, IPCC's activities are divided into three groups. There's the working group one, dealing with physics, working group two, dealing with mitigation, working group three, dealing with adaptation. Mitigation and adaptation for climate change is of course directly related to human activities. <coughs> this is where MPC data comes in. And I, I actually started part of this with the TerraPop project. This was in the initial days of TerraPop when, when uh, there was uh, not a lot of data out there. Things have, things have improved dramatically with TerraPop right now. Um, so here are, uh, just to get started, here are the four students who are uh, primarily involved in what I'm going to present today. This is work uh, that's done with uh, Ujjal, who's right now, uh, who's a faculty uh, at uh, UIUC. <coughs> he, he graduated last year, and that's there, right? Uh, so, so some of the work relates to uh, Lindsay, Megan, Shubo, also. All right, so uh, as I mentioned, this is we part of this project. So some of this work had, had started earlier, but part of, of this was when I was trying to relate my climate change research to human activities. And uh, for that, we started accessing the, the, the TerraPop data. And for, for a variety of reasons, I was actually looking at uh, what, what right now is the SIPAMS international data. Uh, so this is, this is because we wanted to put together, you know, we <coughs> wanted to see the effect of climate change on human activities. Now, these are things that move on very different time scales. Climate change, in many ways, is, is a very slow moving cycle. Well, it's not a cycle. Okay. There are many components of it. Some of it is cyclical, some of it is not. The cyclical parts could be in the order of decades. And we are identifying, you're still identifying things with a periodicity of about 60 years or so in climate data systems. To top off on all those natural variability, you do have climate change. Right? Whereas human activities take place on a, on, relative to that on a much faster scale. So, uh, so there's data relating to that. That's where things started. And as, as I was working through this, I also realized that the data of our, <coughs> let's say, fMRI images also have a very similar structure. You get spatiotemporal data. Things actually depend on what you're doing when you're inside the fMRI machine, whether you're reading a book, seeing a visual image, or doing nothing. It depends on, um, let's say, whether you have a normal brain activity or you're suffering from PTSD or you know, you have something like an Alzheimer's disease, what state that is in. So there are, data science-wise, there's a, quite a bit of similarity. So I'll actually show you some, some stuff relating to climate and neuroimaging data. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about how we are trying to relate that with uh, MPC data, so basically, IPAMS International and IPAMS Terra data. Um, so my major concern, the reason why I started a geometric analysis was because, uh, well, not just in social sciences, in, in a lot of sciences, the first thing that we assume when we've got data, let's say five variables and 30 <coughs> observations, or what have you. Uh, I mean, the data set that I was working with yesterday with Ujjal was uh, IPAMS data from India that had 78 variables and 
for every year 32 rows and it's 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 got a number of rows uh, number of years we we try to shoehorn that data into a gaussian model into well if not a gaussian model then a collection of gaussian models and so on throw in a regression typically a standard linear regression and then pre pretend it's gaussian well we have a lot of uh, reasons to believe, especially, and this is the reason why I'm going to show you climate and neuroimaging data, that uh, that's, that's just not a tenable assumption. That's actually not a tenable assumption in the, in the uh, IPERMS uh, data that we get from India for, for migration, I'm sorry, not for migration, for uh, seasonal employment kind of uh, variables across different age and gender categories. Uh, Gaussian assumptions fail. We make that assumption, A, because that was what people could do for hundreds of years. That's what Gauss started with. Uh, well, maybe people before him. Uh, till about, I would say, mid 80s. Uh, until you had a decent computer that could do a little bit of non-Gaussian analysis. Uh, and that's, that's the first reason. This reason B would be that there's a lot of theory developed for it. Now, when you take that beyond your 70 variables and 500 cases, when you take that to something like a, a actually, you know, all of IPAM's India, Bangladesh, Pakistan data, along with their climate variables, and it's basically the size of the climate variables that dominate out there, you're looking at thousands of variables and, and a, a, a few uh, hundreds of cases so, so, or, or, or orders of magnitude larger than that. There, it is almost impossible to verify or test for uh, Gaussianity. More importantly, the other kinds of methods that you see floating around, things like lasso. You, know, you all know about ridge regression and lasso regression. When is a, a ridge a good thing to do? Well, you know when you actually use ridge. Right? You use ridge when you see collinearity in the variables. But does it make sense to use ridge when you've got, let's say, you know, so the number of variables that you've got is 10,000 with 100 observations? Yes, ridge will produce an answer, but would it produce a sensible <coughs> answer? Uh, that's where the theory part of it comes in. And the assumptions that justify the use of ridge regression, you know, take it beyond its 1960s econometrics context, uh, the, they are not particularly strong. All right? so, so that's where we started uh, looking at some of the geometry around that. And as, as, as I would like to say, this is, this is quite a bit ongoing. We have submitted a few papers. We are in the process of submitting some more. There's a lot of work still to be done. All right. so, as we get into the geometry of data, the way I would like to do this is by trying to develop a method for multivariate quantiles. So I'll, I'll start by explaining what is univariate quantiles, which all of you know, but just, just, just to you know, set up some notations and uh, you know, recapitulate stuff. So let's look at the standard normal distribution, and let's pretend we are in a, in a probability class here. All right. So that's the standard normal probability density function. You, you know about this. This is the Gaussian shape, the bell shape that, that you see. And what's a quantile? A quantile is given a probability value, let's say 0.9. It's that point below which the probability happens to be 0.9. So that, so. So z less than or equal to that point, the probability of that is 0.9. All right? So it, it's a point here such that the area under this curve up to that point is 0.9. The area under this curve from negative infinity to positive infinity is 1. So that's what makes it a probability. All right? And this is the point where you hit 0.9. So this is it. Uh, 0.9, you hit that at 1.68. Yeah, that's where your 1.96 comes in. 1.96 is where you hit 0.975. That gives you the 95% confidence interval. Yeah. Uh, so, so here's 
So this is actually a quantile. This is tremendously important because anytime you want to make a, 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 a statement about the significance of what you are saying, you know, anybody can propose an estimator. Anybody can throw out a number or, or state an alternative fact. right? Uh, how do you know your fact is a fact and not an alternative fact? Well, the way you do it in, in, in sciences, in most sciences, or maybe in all sciences, is to essentially assign a score to it. Give it a significance level. Say that, OK, I'm, I'm this percent confident, I'm 99 percent confident that this coefficient is positive, or that thing actually happens to be similar to these two other things. How do you do that? You basically go from a probability, your 90% confidence, so 0.9 probability, to a quantile somewhere. Quantile of the relevant distributions, the distribution of your test statistic under the null hypothesis and so on. So there's a relationship between quantiles and probabilities that we hugely exploit here. That's, that's how a lot of uh, you know, assignment of significance to scientific statements happen. So that's what quantiles do. It, it just takes probabilities and maps it to the relevant uh, probability space. So here it is again. This is the domain of a quantile. It's a function. It's the domain, 0 to 1. And it takes a point here and maps it here. So 0.5 maps to 0 and you know, negative 0.16 maps to 0 0.025 and so on. So it's, it's actually a one-to-one -one function mathematically for things like a normal distribution. It has, it's a smooth, nice, nice looking function. Uh, and you've seen this before. This is not terribly different. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through stages as to how we go from this notion to a multivariate quantile, which is kind of non-trivial beyond this point. And this is what I was saying. You know, uh, uh, so formally, a quantile is, for any alpha, that's a probability, is the number below which you, know, you observe your random variable with a probability alpha. So that's, that's its definition. Uh, why is it important? Uh, I, I'd have a few theorems. Just feel free to ignore all these technical statements. I'll, I'll try to explain them in words. It's, it's a one-to-one -one map. If I give you a quantile, you can tell me what probability that it corresponds to. And if I give you a probability, you can tell me what quantile that corresponds to. That one-to-oneness makes, makes statistical inference so crisp. That's what makes it work. And this, this is a theorem that just says that. All right. So if we have got uh, 70,000 variables, why don't we just do this 70,000 times? Uh, that's because you're actually going to get something really, really ugly. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have plots for this. So let's, let's think in terms of two variables. Let's say heights and uh, weights of babies, right? Your typical classroom <laughs> first statistics class example. This is how, for neonatal babies, heights and weights are related. Think of getting a uh, 95% coverage set, so a set that would cover 95% of the spots. You'd ideally want a set like that, right? You'd want an ellipse like that. But what happens if you do it only for height and only for weight and make a big box? You would have a bunch of empty space. And, you know, so, so, so your inferences would not have enough power associated with them. You need a lot more uh, data. And as, so in two dimensions, you have got this baguette in between. And if you try to put that baguette inside a rectangle, most of the space is just blank space. No data, no significance, nothing to do with reality out there. So in closing, you know, doing a univariate quantile, you know, 70,000 times over basically means that you're, you, you have created a system that has absolutely no power, no, no reproducibility whatsoever. So we don't do that. We'd like to get something that 
actually has the shape of the baguette. And here is, here is what the geometry comes in. Yeah, we want to get the baguette when it is a baguette. When it's shaped like a, let's say, let's say a boomerang or so, shaped like some other, you know, three balloons floating around. We would like to get that shape. So that's, that's where the geometry comes in. Uh, how do you get about doing that? Let's, let's look at an alternative viewpoint of quantiles. So quantiles was that map between probabilities and you know, the support of a random variable that I was showing you. OK. Here's, here's an alternative viewpoint that's a bit more mathematical, but that's just as equivalent. And some of you, you might actually remember back uh, from one of your stat classes about this. A median is actually the minimizer of, so you know what a least squared does, right? You square, you take x minus q, square it up, minimize that, that's how you get a mean. How do you get a median? Well, don't square it up, just take absolute value. That gives you a median. All right, so that gives you the middle point of a bunch of observations. Uh, that's something that we knew. Actually, this is also something that's not uh, totally unknown. It, this was rediscovered in a textbook in the 1970s. Uh, you know, so people started working on this in late 90s, and then somebody found, well, this was an exercise in Ferguson's textbook. So you could actually get any alphite quantile by minimizing this thing. This is, this is an uglier looking list, but you could, you could do an optimization problem here. All right, let's now go through a few steps where I take this, the thing in red, and try and generalize this to a multivariate context, okay? The first step is to just rewrite two alpha minus one as u. Remember, alpha was a probability between 0 and 1. So u right now is between negative 1 and 1. So the median corresponds to alpha equal to 1 half, so u equal to 0. Your lower quantiles, the 5 percent quantile now is a negative value of u and so on. So this expression is same as that expression. Uh, and this is something that you could this is, everything is in one dimension. So it grant me that this looks like, the first part looks same as that part. The second part, which was u times x minus q, is surely u transpose times x minus q. For one dimension, that's, that's just tautology. u is same as u tra transpose. But it took a few decades for people to make this breakthrough. But once you think along these lines, you'd want to replace this, the absolute value with a norm, a standard Euclidean norm, and this u transpose x minus q with an inner product, which is your standard Euclidean inner product. And you've suddenly got the same expression in fairly arbitrary dimensions for any vector. So if x now is your bivariate random variable, you know, heights of babies and weights of babies. So x would be a bivariate random variable. So q would actually also be a vector of the same length, q1, q2. u would now have to be something that's two-dimensional. And then that's, that's the definition of a quantile. This is not something that I'm imagining out of thin air. Uh, Haldane, who I'm sure all of you have heard of, great, great, great scientist. Uh, he was the first one to actually suggest this without so much of a background to it. He thought it would be a good idea to actually try out something like this. <coughs> this was not the formula that he came up with. This is modified from what he came up with. But the first ideas was, <coughs> was from Haldane. And then Chaudhary in a Journal of American Statistical Association paper was the first one to come up with this formula. All right, so that gives you, if I, if I minimize this, that gives me a multivariate quantile. Now, this is not what we'll do. We'll actually generalize this a little bit, but uh, 
and I want you to totally ignore this slide. What I that was 1996 when that formula came about. So this formula in red came about. We realized it has its strengths. It has a few significant weaknesses. It could not be applied, for example, for p greater than n case, the so-called high-dimensional big data case. So we now have something that, you know eases geometry a bit more. Projection along the direction of u, projection orthogonal to it, put different weights, and do all kinds of nasty stuff. So you've got another minimization function that sits somewhere in the software. I just wanted to show you that there's a formula that generalizes the original one. If you put lambda equal to 1, you get back this thing. Uh, so that's what a generalized uh, spatial quantile, so that's what it's called these days, generalized spatial quantile actually satisfies. I, I don't want you to go over formulas, so let's get back to uh, what we are talking about here. It is, of course, in one dimension, it's exactly this notion. So you take an alpha, push it to Q of alpha. The, the value says that this region uh, up, to, up to that point, so this region has, has alpha probabilities. 0.9 goes to 1.68, that kind of thing. What we are doing first is that taking that probability that you saw on the previous slide, making it two, ti two times that probability minus one. So zero to one now goes from negative one to one. I'm sure you cannot see it. You just have to trust me for it, uh, the, the writing out here. But this is, this is that elementary transformation that we first do. So what this thing, negative one to one, Geometrically, that's the unit ball in one dimension. What do I mean by a unit ball? It's those numbers whose length, whose, okay, you know, length from origin is less than or equal to one. Right? So our u is something that sits inside negative one to one. It's just a point for which norm of u happens to be less than one. That's what we generalize. So this is this is a quantile. Grid. That's what we generalize, let's say, in two dimensions. So the domain of this function is all vectors whose length is less than or equal to 1. So unit sphere in whatever space you're talking about. And you take a point out there, so that's the range in two dimensions. You take any point out there, maybe in that direction, and maybe of length, let's say, 0.78. This would have a map to Q. How do you get that map? Well, you solve that big, ugly optimization problem. Uh, of course, you don't know that physically. Like, uh, so that's, that's another talk, how to actually do that. But that's, let's not get there. Uh, again, totally ignore the math formulas. I just wanted to put in there, say, just to let you know that in case you're interested, there's a lot of math going out here saying that this is a legitimate proper, consistent thing to do. If you love your root and consistency, well, there's your root and consistency. It sh shows that the sample ver versions converge to the population versions. Lots of other stuff, which was fun when we did it, but not so much fun afterwards. So, uh, here is the one that I'll actually show you results for today. We had this enormous optimization problem we just put lambda equal to zero, so that this big chunk of it just dropped off. Uh, why did we do that? Well, this, when we were using other lambda values, we saw that the quantiles are tremendously insensitive to the choice of lambda, as long as lambda was between, let's say, zero and two, or something like that. So if I picked up lambda equal to 0.25, or 1.25, or 1.75, the QU vectors, so, so those red vectors that I showed you, they differed very little either in terms of length or in terms of directions. Uh, so we had started with lambda equal to zero, the, the actual optimization, the actual you know, solving of this, uh, this, this minimization problem. And then we decided, let's just stay with lambda equal to zero, and let's study the properties of that. That was a wonderful thing to do, because what happens is that at lambda equal to 0, there is actually no relationship between 
the dimensions of your problem and your sample size. So you can do this quantile at a trillion dimensions with 10 data points. I'm not suggesting that you do it. I mean, the, 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 the quality of, of that estimated product depends, of course, on the sample size. But the fact that you can at all do it, that in itself is a, is a tremendous thing. Uh, I showed you that baguette. We can construct baguettes, boomerangs, balloons, you know, go for stadiums out of these quantiles. They would have exact coverage. So if you say that that has, well, not a stadium, coverages in statistics is about probability, right? So if you say that this set has covers 90% of the points, it would have exactly 90% of the points. So again, a tremendously important thing. This is, again, fun mathematics. If you were to do this with your EEG data, or let's say your, your, your uh, uh, financial time series, which are measured on an intensely fine time scale, that's effectively an infinite dimensional object. That's where you get a trillion data points very fast. Uh, theoretically, it, the whole thing would go through. So you don't have to encounter a curse of dimensionality out there. So it has that one-to-one -one relationship that I, 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 I rambled on a little bit, saying that that's what makes statistics, that's what makes significance work. So that's, that's there. Uh, or, uh, back to showing you stuff that's actually nice to see. Uh, okay. So here is two such scatter plots like the one that I drew out there. The first one is the standard Gaussian shape in two dimensions. You could, you could pick your orientation, you could make it you know, more spread out or, or, or more concentrated. But here's a typical shape. Here is something that's not really Gaussian. OK, so I delivered, so the blue ones and the red ones, these are curves that we get out of, the, of what I was saying, this geometric quantile, the generalized spatial quantile. The black one is what you get if you pretend it's Gaussian. So when it is Gaussian, the blue and red one are supposed to have different coverages. Okay? So they're deliberately made into a different shape, different size. But when, when it is Gaussian, our red curve has very little difference from your black curve that you get from your textbook Gaussian method-based statistics. When it is not Gaussian, it does way better. And I, I mean, I, I, I wanted to pick out an example where, where the Gaussian also seemed reasonable. You could obviously pick out examples where, where this black blob is really, really, really bad. And the red one always traces the, the, the curvature of your data cloud. I'm showing this in two dimensions because that's all that we could put on a, on a slide. It does it, well, we could verify it for arbitrary dimensions. We, we definitely tried of the order of 5,000 dimensions. And then, of course, in order to visualize, we had to take a two or three dimensional projections. But it always maintained the shape of that data cloud, data scatter. So that was the point of doing all of that. All right, uh, let me just quickly go over a few things that we get out of this. One of the things that we get out of this method of thinking is a center outward ranking of observations. All right. the, the innermost point and then outer circles and then more outer circles and so on. This is not a linear ordering. You cannot get this in, in I mean, it cannot do a perfect linear ordering, a perfect ordering of points in more than one dimensions. But at least you could do stuff of this sort. You could see what's the most interior point, what's in the next circle, and what's in the third circle, and, and things along that sort. Uh, there are, of course, choices of tuning parameters involved. You know, that lambda thingy was there. So it, it, it determines the sharpness at which these things decay. So don't put a value to its absolute number, but these are all consistent rankings. 
partial rankings at least. Uh, you could say which are the regions where, and this is what we have used this for, where seasonal migration of labor actually depends on temperature and precipitation. Uh, places where it's stable and places where it depends only on temperature, places where it depends only on precipitation, places where it depends on both. Uh, so, so such relationships and ranking along those relationships, so if I take all this three-dimensional space, we could do similar things, you know, the innermost circle and then the next football-shaped region around it and the next football-shaped region around it, and we could do this in many dimensions. Uh, one of the things that it actually helps us do is distinguish between <coughs> two different data clouds, two different data scatters that do not have a Gaussian shape, and that could be in very high dimensions. So again, an illustration. Uh, this is what Ujjal, the student, created. There was one data that of, of this sort, another data, which is this red blob out there. Uh, this one is definitely not Gaussian. And this thing is actually sitting inside this whole thing. So if we did a black Gaussian confidence region, it would enclose both data sets. Now, what we get out of this is, so this green curve is the 90th, so that region covers 90% of the points inside here. This black curve covers 90% of the points, 90% of the red points. And this blue line is actually the separating. So if you want to separate the, the red dots from the black dots, you find out if it lies above the blue line or below the blue line. Um, this is, this sort of problems are known as supervised learning or classification in machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, this is actually a published work. We do very well in terms of speed as well as accuracy compared to other methods that do as well in accuracy. So in terms of comparable methods, in terms of accuracy, we take much lower computation time. The, the central processing unit uh, takes much lower time. And their standard Gaussian-based textbook methods, they of course take much less time, but they also produce terrible answers. Uh, so that's, that's the trade-off. Uh, we actually have not, this is, this is something that was published before deep learning became so fashionable. So we actually need to try this for deep learning. Uh, deep learning, I don't think would do very well in terms of this, because deep learning does take a lot of time. Uh, this is from us, this is a standard data set. There are then numerous ones of this sort that we tried out. Sorry. Uh, let me go to the next bit. Um, some time back, you know, I, I actually uh, wrote about this. Uh, how, how could we use these kind of quantile to do two things? This is there in the abstract of today's talk also. And this is what Ujjal and I are currently working on. Uh, so, so here's the idea. We could try, I'm not sure if you can actually see this, but there are concentric light green circles around here. We could take this sort of a data cloud and try and do two of the most important things that we do anytime we do data analysis. We do uh, regression and we do something like a dimension reduction, a principal components which relates to factor analysis and a bunch of other stuff that we do here. So what's a regression, right? A regression is, let's think in terms of, again, two-dimensional variables, and let's just look at the black dots. That's the scatter. All right. If we, so here's, here's my idea about how to use this kind of a method for either regression or, or for principal component analysis. Uh, start with the centermost point, all right? Then as you go through these concentric circles, Take the, that, that, so for every point on a circle, let's say here's a circle, take that point on the circle that's farthest from the origin, which basically means, see, these concentric circles are not supposed to be perfect circles. They are supposed to wrap around the data. 
okay uh, so they are uneven distances away from the origin take the one with, with the which is farthest from the origin increase the norm of your u vector more again take that if you do that you get this red line this is just the bunch of points which are farthest away from this center right and and they have some internal consistency condition Ujjal and I started calling this the first principal direction. This is basically half of your principal component going in one direction. There's the other half of it. It's very coincidental just because this is Gaussian looking data that they're on opposite sides of each other. If I were to do it in that, in that you know, U-shaped data, it would start here, go off on this direction for the red line, go off on that direction for the blue line. And I want you to imagine this being doable in, again, you know, 70,000 dimensions. Okay. This, the blue going into the red, is actually the regression curve. It's an approximation. It's, it's, it's a, it's a non-parametric regression. It, so it doesn't have as much smoothness. It looks just like the regression line if I were to have a Gaussian data. So we lose very, very little in a Gaussian setup if my Gaussian assumption is right. We, of course, gain a lot if it is non-Gaussian. Uh, we get our perfect, you know, uh, you know, the first four principal components are red, blue, cyan, and magenta. Don't blame me for the colors, blame for just for the colors. But so, so this data set has been created such that the regression line is supposed to look like that. Uh, that's, uh, for those of you who work with, you know, nonlinear or non-parametric principal components, non-parametric fact, factor analysis, that's your first factor. We do have a more general version of this because I would consider that half of a this as one factor and that as another factor, but that's, that's just semantics. Let's not bother about that. Why are we getting these bands? Because we actually can do significance testing with that. So with that same data, if I were to try and find out what's the 90% you know, per region where the red curve, my first principal direction lies, well, it's actually this band that's got 100%, and then we could reduce it to make it you know, 90%, 95%, whatever you want. So this gives you a totally geometry-based, very, very minimal assumption-driven uh, regression, as well as principal components. You could do hypothesis testing. Uh, you could do ordering. This is what we have been working on on right now with, with uh, uh, a bit of, you know, EPUMS international data. Ordering of, well, provinces in Bangladesh based on their needs for, for a variety of things against, corrected for monsoon conditions and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, so so deficiencies, deficiencies in resources for a, for a variety of stuff. The data is actually non-Gaussian. And this is how, uh, well, it doesn't look like that because that's, that's across many variables, but this is a two-dimensional cartoon of the kind of stuff that we're looking at. Uh, the other thing that I promised in the abstract and that I'm really, really excited about is testing for linearity, testing for Gaussianity. Because if you can assure yourself, if you can guarantee that this is in 70,000 dimensions, it is actually Gaussian, go ahead and use that. But how do you test that it's, it's actually Gaussian? There's, there's a bit more to the story. People don't just assume it's Gaussian or it's linear. They actually assume it's sparse, because our computers can only handle sparse Gaussian. So all the theory right now that you see around big data is ba based on sparse Gaussian. How do you know it's Gaussian, it's linear, it's sparse? Well, here's a way of actually testing for it. What's that word you're using, the last word? Sparse. S-P-A-R-S-E. 
And what does it mean? It means that the whole thing actually sits on a three-dimensional curve inside your 70,000 dimensional space. So you've got you know, six, nine, 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 seven dimensions, and that's just got white noise. Uh, you can imagine how I'm going to do a test of linearity out here, right? Uh, we just string together this and to that and, and try and see if a straight line approximation to this lies within this blue and red bands. We have to correct something for, for this convergence at the origin, but that's all right. That's something that we can mathematically uh, tackle, but uh, that's, that's what we're doing. But, uh, let's not, we have actually used this. So this is the bit that, that is getting a little bit of attention. We've used this for variable selection. Let's not go into that. Uh, this is our data application that we have developed fully or quite a bit fully. This is about monsoon precipitation. Uh, as I was mentioning to you, I, I work on climate change and modeling the monsoon, understanding the physics of monsoon is, is one of the biggest challenges in climate science. And we would like to actually take this understanding the physics component of it and bring it to other pigs. I mean, this is, this seasonal rainfall actually feeds about two billion people in around, well, not just India, but all over here. A bit here, a bit here also. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, so, we, right now, the process of actually select, finding out what affects an Indian monsoon, that part is complete. We'd like to take this and see how does this affect, for example, uh, seasonal migration, seasonal labor. Uh, employment across various categories for a variety of things. Uh, one of our data sources just got lost because of a change in Indian government a few years back, but that data is there somewhere. But anyway, uh, so this is the data that we are actually using for this analysis. Uh, eventually, we'd like to get some data from Bangladesh also. Uh, I'm not sure if we can get data from other neighboring countries, but Bangladesh certainly has it. All right. Uh, again, too many words here. What I want you to appreciate that this is big data. This is a data that has got a number of kinds of variables. Some are, you know, solutions to partial differential equations uh, with big computers. Some are uh, transform indices and so on. And we'd like to actually get hold of things like intensity, duration, frequency of extreme events, which is what affects people. Again, too many stuff. I don't want you to, again, read through this. The reason why I have this slide is the first thing that a climate scientist tells us when we try to do precipitation modeling, monsoon kind of a precipitation modeling, is that the greatest determinant is what's known as the clausius clapeyron equation. For those of you who have done you know, fluid dynamics, they know about this. clausius clapeyron equation, uh, that relates how much of precipitable moisture that's there. That's a topmost entry. That's, that's actually very orders of magnitude, the first thing that we detect. Then wind, wind directions, and then of course, it depends on moisture, depends on how high up in the mountains you are. These are all independently verified determinants of Indian monsoons. Let's, let me just go over the results uh, to give you some time to ask questions. We have much reduced mean square error that's what you see here. This is the bias. That's the mean square error. We do a much better job of prediction. So the black curve is 2012 actual data. Blue is what we predicted for 2012 based on data up to 2010. And the red curve is what's currently used. You see, we are way better aligned with the black curve than, than what's there in the literature. Uh, Let's, let me close with this. The goal was basically to rank states in terms of their needs and resources. That <laughs> research is still ongoing. We have got the physics part settled. There are other parts that we are, we are pulling data off Terrapop and a bunch of other places to try and put these things together. Uh, 
that part is ongoing. One big challenge happens to be, you know, climate regions and political regions do not align perfectly. These are also on different time scales, so that's that's one challenge. Let me skip over this part and just go to, you know, people who uh, gave us some grants for this. And uh, thanks a lot for patiently sitting through this. Mm -hmm. so.